Right. Okay. So we're going to let everyone keep on flowing in, but welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Together We Read Live. My name is Joe Skelly, and I am one of the co-hosts of Overdrive's Professional Book Nerds podcast. If you're not familiar with the podcast, my co-host Emma and I host six plus episodes a month where we give book recommendations, reader advice, and interview authors. The podcast is available on all platforms, and we hope to see you there. I am so happy to welcome you all here today. Before we dive in, just some quick housekeeping. You can submit questions about the book via the Q&A button in Zoom. Just look for that button that says Q&A. You can also pop anything in here if you have any Zoom issues. And Emma, my co-host, will be there kind of looking through the different questions as they pop up. And as well as our teammate Gabby will be helping out in the background as well. Now, Emma will be helping me pick out questions once we get to the, the live Q&A portion. Uh, so while we do have plenty of time set aside, it will never be enough time for all of the amazing questions that I'm sure you all have. We are recording this conversation and you'll be able to access it live at a later date. We'll also be discussing spoilers in the book today, as I know Tara will tell you all. Uh, so keep that in mind before you dive in. Last, we are so excited to be giving away five signed copies of One Summer in Savannah, along with advanced copies of Tara's new book, Long After We Are Gone. Everyone who is attending live today is eligible to win. If your name is selected, you'll receive an email from me uh, to find out where to send your books to. So be excited, stick around for that. So hope that you are going to win. And with that, it looks like our number has slowed down a little bit. So I feel comfortable popping in there and getting us going. With that, I'd like to introduce our guest, Tara Shelton Harris. Tara is a librarian and freelance writer who now writes upmarket fiction with bittersweet endings. As a freelancer, her work has appeared in consumer and trade magazines. One Summer in Savannah is her first novel. Tara has worked as a librarian for over 15 years, where one of her chief duties is the coordination of all aspects of adult de collection development for both print and digital. Originally from Illinois, she now lives in Alabama with her husband, Jamel. Welcome, Tara. I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. Hi, hello. Such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I am so glad to get to talk to you today. Uh, we were gushing about it beforehand, but your <laughs> backdrop is perfect. <laughs> I think I have a book out called One Summer in Savannah, right? <laughs> I think you might have a book out. Mine is, of yeah. course, uh, no way able to compete with, <laughs> with that giant poster. Um, yeah. <laughs> to get us started, mm -hmm. I, I know we're talking spoilers, and I know everyone here has, has probably read the book already, or I hope right. so, we're at the end of That's Together right. We Read. That's right. Can you give us just your quick summary of One Summer in Savannah? Absolutely. So One Summer Savannah tells a story of Sarah Lancaster, who is this poet that's living this quiet life in coastal Maine with her eight-year-old genius daughter, Alana. And Alana came into this world after a sexual assault. And every day, Alana is starting to ask Sarah more and more questions about her father. Questions, of course, Sarah cannot answer. And so she knows that one day is going to come that she's going to have to explain to Alana about her birth, but she doesn't know how until one day she receives a phone call that her father is ill and she must return home to Savannah to kind of take care of him and to face the ghosts of her past. And so while she's back in Savannah taking care of her father and running his bookstore, she is very desperate to protect Alana from the Wilers. The Wilers are the powerful family of the man who attacked her who have no idea that Alana exists. And Sarah thinks she can succeed. Everything she heard about them, they've moved away, they've moved on until she accidentally runs into the identical twin brother, Jacob, of the man who was, attacked her, who also recently returned home to kind of understand this event and try to put together back his family. But Sarah doesn't know if she can trust him or not, but she's very desperate. So she enters into this agreement with him in exchange for his silence. He and only he can spend time with her. And as they all begin to spend more and more time together, Sarah and Jacob are drawn together in unexpected ways. I mean, it gets me every time. <laughs> uh, now, I know we have so many wonderful questions coming in already, but yes. I do just want to lay out some of the groundwork, talk about your process and working sure. on this book. 
But to sure. start at the very top, I wanted yeah. to kick off with your note to the reader. Uh, not only is your message so thoughtful, it's a great way to give a warning about the topics ahead. And you give permission to step away and come back later right. or step right. away completely. Mm-hmm. What what led you to this, this heads up and mm-hmm. this story of trauma? Mm-hmm. And, you know, how how did you come to this? Okay, so, and I'll talk about it more because I'm sure it'll come up in the Q&A, but um, this, story is in, this story is inspired by a dear friend of mine. And so this is um, loosely based on what happened to her and her story. And so I knew that potentially other sexual assault survivors could pick up this book. And I believe strongly in the in the in, in, in trigger warnings and author's notes to kind of give the the readers an option of stepping into a story. You know, I've worked in collective development for almost two decades now. And trigger warnings and author notes are starting to become more and more popular in books and just giving people a heads up on any potential trauma. You know, we bring a little piece of our lives, our history into everything we read. And I feel as if we should give the as a as a writer, we should give you know the reader the opportunity to say, you know what? That may be triggering for me. I need to protect my mental health. And this may be not a book that I need to pick up. And so and I knew this book was going to be triggering for um, sexual assault survivors. So I want to give them that option. There's nothing like reading a book and you see, you don't see something coming that could be potentially triggering. And so I definitely wanted to include that um, as as a warning to the, to the reader, because I knew it was a hard book for me to write. And so I can only imagine if I was a sexual assault survivor or just someone that's really sensitive to something like that, what that could be triggering for them and just giving them an option of not, not reading it at all. I think that's so important. And as you said, we are seeing, content warnings, trigger warnings popping yeah. up regularly yeah. in books. And it, it's such a wonderful thing to see because, right, it a mm-hmm. lot of times can come out of nowhere. You could be 75% through that book right. and that's when right. it happens. Mm-hmm. Now, also on the, the broad strokes here, you have powerful themes of family, forgiveness, mm-hmm. being a parent mm-hmm. woven throughout. Mm-hmm. From the start of the mother-daughter unit to kind of the return of home and being a mother to your parent, how did this become the package that you're delivering both a story of forgiveness and love? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I'm a pantser, so I don't know what my books, how they're going to <laughs> unfold as I as I start to write them. I just, I have a theme and the theme of this book was forgiveness. And so I just kind of wrote that, you know, I knew that everything that was going to be revolved around forgiveness, but also I like to, for my books, I like to keep my readers entertained. And so I love books. My favorite type of books are those books that have these layers to it, you know, and I knew I wanted this book to have not just this theme of what Sarah was going to do, but just have these layers to it and all these little subplots. And so I started thinking about what would be strong enough for Sarah to return home. And of course, it would be a parent. You know, if you love your parents, you know, a family member, someone that you love, that's enough to make you say, you know what, I'm going to put aside my trauma and I'm going to come take care of, you know, my parent. And so I knew that was a theme that I was going to have in the book. And then as I got these things, more and more of the story just started to kind of like unfold amongst each other. When I first started writing the book, it was only supposed to be a Sarah POV. There was not going to be a Jacob POV. And I got about halfway through it and I just felt like something was missing. And I thought, what about Jacob? What about Jacob? What I wanted to do was not for the readers to feel this empathy for this family, for Daniel, but just to show what it was like for them as well. Like Jacob really served a good point for Sarah's story because he was able to provide her with context to what happened. And that's something that a lot of sexual assault survivors do not have. They never know the why. They never know how it messed up the other family. They never know like all these important details. And I wanted Jacob to be able to give those to Sarah. So that meant he had to have a POV as well. So then he gets a POV and guess what? He has to have his own story as well. And so he had his own forgiveness that he had to give out and to receive as well. And so then it was, okay, so what could have triggered this event? And then that's where the grief came in for them. And so it all kind of just kind of unfolded because I'm a pantser and I plan nothing beforehand <laughs> But it just really got me thinking about their stories. And so that's how it's just kind of unfolded in layers. I I love the the layered <laughs> visual of that, though. You went, this is the recipe I want to make. 
what's going to get me there? That's right. That's right. That's right. It just builds out beautifully. And it does give you so many ways to play with perspective, to play with both sides of the story. Yeah. How, as, a, as the pantser that you are, how mm-hmm. did you go about keeping yourself organized? Like, what does that process look like for you while oh, creating? Oh, uh, I, oh, you assume that I'm organized. <laughs> I am not organized <laughs> in any kind of way. Uh, if you've been around me, you know I handwrite all of my books. And so um, I write on whatever I can. If I don't have my notebook on me, I write on scraps of paper, recycled paper. And so those serve as scenes. And so what I end up doing is taking these little scraps of pieces of paper and kind of putting it together to make this story. So yeah, I'm not organized as I should be. I sound organized. When I was saying that, I, I thought to myself, like, wow, I sound so organized. I am not. I am not. And so I start pulling my hair out when I have all these different scenes and I have to kind of just put it all together. But Mm -hmm. the one thing um, that I do that helps is I write the end of my books first. I have, I do know that I do know how the book ends. And so since this is a spoiler conversation, I will say that I knew that I wanted Birdie to have that scene at the end where she just completely broke down. I knew I wanted that because I was trying to draw a parallel between Sarah and Birdie throughout the entire book, that they're not much different from each other. And as a matter of fact, Sarah says that. Sarah says, we're not that much different from each other, just two mothers who would do anything to protect their children. And I knew I wanted that at the end. But in order to make that emotional pull for the reader to happen, for people to feel that, I had to make Birdie as mean as possible. And so I knew that. So I knew the end. So if I, okay, if I want people to feel this emotional pull, I have to make Birdie just be this evil mother throughout the yeah. entire book. And so knowing stuff like that helps kind of keep me organized and pulls me forward. This this is why I am a reader and not a writer. <laughs> <laughs> because once you said, I start from the, the back and I work my way around, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way my brain, I mean, my ADHD, my ADHD brain just mm-hmm. does wonderful things at times. <laughs> and that's exactly what it does. It, it keeps it all together for me. So, yeah. It's figuring out how to make that work for you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and thinking of how to make it work for you, set the stage for me. What are your writing essentials? Where are you? What's the soundscape? Do you have snacks with you? Okay. Beverages? Okay. Um, I need quiet in order to write. So um, I have, I I know a lot of writers see scenes and they kind of write what they see. I don't see scenes. I don't see people. I hear voices. And my husband says, please stop telling people that. They're going to think you're crazy. (laughs) But I hear voices. My characters speak to me. And so they kind of whisper things into my ear. And so my job is just to kind of jot down what they're trying to tell me. That's how I knew that I needed a Jacob POV because Jacob was coming on very strong. And I remember saying to myself, I can't use any of this because you don't have a POV. And so it was, I would write it down and think, okay, how can I incorporate it? But it became a lot easier to incorporate once he had his own POV. And so I just kind of write down, I need quiet in order to do that, in order to listen. So I don't listen to any music and um, I write anywhere. You know, I write in my car, my lunch break. I write, you know, at stoplights. I write at home. I write anywhere. My husband's a football coach. So I write at his football games. Don't tell him that. And so I write any, anywhere I can um, just to get just to get things down. Um, I drink coffee in the morning and then af- in the afternoon, a Sprite is fine. I love popcorn. So I'm snacking on popcorn most of the time. But yeah, just simple things. But I I, I'm, I get locked in. So I'm that person that I get to writing because I do handwrite, which people just are baffled by that. I'm I'm floored. <laughs> <laughs> and so I handwrite everything. And so when I kind of just get locked in, locked in, I'll look up and an hour, hour and a half has gone by. I forget to eat sometimes just because I'm so locked in to what the characters are telling me. And so I just kind of just go from there. It's absolutely your art expressing itself the way right. that it's meant to. And it, Right. ends to just a beautiful piece thank you now absolutely one last thing because I know we've got we've got burning questions coming in and I'm I keep <laughs> peeking over they're all so good when I say public library what comes to mind oh home 
Mm-hmm. My goodness, it's my home. I mean, my first memories were made in a library. My mother got her degrees, you know, when we were older, when she was older and we were already in the, in the world. And so she would park us at the library while she was studying. And so my first early memories are of libraries. And back then, you know, I really didn't know that I could do that job and be a librarian. And so, you know, blessedly, I was able to be able to become a librarian and be in libraries. And so libraries will always be home for me. And just because I understand the power of them, you know, libraries yes, save yes. libraries save lives. You know, I'd be the first person, you know, I will die on that hill. Libraries save lives, it enhance lives. And, you know, libraries change based on the needs of the people that we serve. And that's why, you know, libraries are so important, but it's such a welcoming place. It's that third space where people can go and just be without the expectation of spending money. And it's just, for me, it's home. It, libraries remove so many barriers for us. They right. offer more than what we could ever right. imagine. They that's always right. have some extra thing that you go, I didn't know I could get museum I passes here or. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm so excited. I got to ask you that. I, I try to ask all my authors that, but this yeah. is the first time my author is also a librarian. Oh, librarian. So... That's so cool. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, I think I've given us some time to warm up. Are you ready okay. to dive in? I, I am ready. I am ready. Our, okay. But I can tell you that I know at least three of the most popular questions I'm going to be asked. I know three of them, so I'm ready for them. Perfect. Well, we'll start with this one. Loved the cover. Who's the artist? Oh, um, I actually, her name escapes me at the moment, Mm -hmm. but she, from what I understand, she is also the graphic artist that does Emily Henry's um, titles as well. So yes, I know, right? Like me, a debut author, (laughs) you know, Emily Henry in the same sentence. My goodness. So yeah, I forget her name, but I um after we the cover for One Summer Savannah was finalized, I did find her and thank her for such a beautiful cover. It is, it is absolutely stunning. Uh, mm-hmm. and I and it also my eyes just also keep directing to the other cover behind you as well, but we'll talk about that sure. book later. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sure this is probably one of the three you're waiting for. Uh, is speaking in prose slash poetry a disorder? I would have liked to understand more about why Sarah's father spoke like that. Okay. And okay. That is from so yes. Andrea. Yes, Andrea, this is one of the most popular questions that I receive as to why Jose speaks in poetry. And there's, it's a twofold reason for it. One, um, Hosea's character is kind of loosely based on my grandfather. When my grandfather, when I was young, my grandfather suffered a stroke and he lost his ability to speak. And so for the rest of his life, we had to decipher what he was trying to tell us through movements and sounds that he made. And so I knew I wanted to honor him in some way, but I also needed Sarah's father to speak words. And so originally I was just going to kind of incorporate a little poetry in there as a way of, because with poetry, you know, what do you have to do after you read a poem? You have to learn to decipher, you know, what that poem is trying to tell you, what that author is trying to tell you. And so that very much spoke to how we had to communicate with my grandfather. But also I wanted to not discuss and talk about the fact that um, Hosea could be on the spectrum. And, but I didn't want to make it a big deal. I, I mean, I feel like some of these things should just be, we have to start to normalize that there are people on the spectrum, that are people that are different from us. And so I kind of wanted both of those aspects to come together. And I've heard from so many readers that said, you know, thank you for the Hosea character. They they either loved the fact that he spoke solely in poetry or they had someone in their family, their father, cousin, sister, mother, that either went mute or have a different form of communication style. And I was really happy that I can I was able to let them see someone that they love reflected in a, in a book that way. And but I originally didn't have him speaking solely in poetry, but it worked. <laughs> it just worked. And I just I knew my editor, Erin, I knew she was going to say, no, we're not doing this. But she loved it. <laughs> and she she never told me that I couldn't do it. So I kept going. And poetry, you know, I'm, I'm an English major. I have several English degrees. And so poetry tends to be, you know, I'm that person, you know, people are quoting song lyrics. I'm that person that like knows pieces of poetry. And so it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So we kept it. I love it. Did you have any interesting things that popped up? Did you like, was everything in a place where you could quote it freely or did you have to worry about clearing? Yes, we (laughs) had to. That's what I thought of. (laughs) 
you know, me being a, me uh, as a librarian, I understood that there were some poems that I just could not use it. Everything that was used was in a public domain. So I knew I had to keep it to the public domain at first. And so that's why I relied on a lot of the older poems. But a lot of the older ones are my favorites and they're already in the public domain. You know, a lot of Cummings, a lot of Yay. As a matter of fact, one of the two of the Cummings poems had just went into the public domain whenever I was writing. So I was like, yes. But poetry like Whitman and Yates, they're already in there. Um, and so I was able to use those. There's one by Robinson Jeffers, um, The Tides Are In Our Veins, We Still Mirror the Stars, which is one of my favorite poems of his, um, was not in the public domain. And so I reached out to his estate and I held my breath to ask them if I could use it. And they were like, yeah, sure. Just, you know, mention us in the copyright page. And I was like, okay, great. And then there was an Emily Dickinson poem that I did pay a teeny tiny amount to be able to use but for the most part all the rest of them were in the public domain okay that's fair but that yeah yeah my 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 marketing and publishing brain immediately went <laughs> so yeah. how did this work yeah. yeah i i see we're sticking to characters here um i've okay. been trying to understand why alana can't wear a watch where does that come from and sorry it just jumped on me <laughs> Uh, where does that come from? And... Okay, there it is. And her obsession with lost time. Would you rather have a moment last 10 more seconds in a day or change a decision you made in your day? Okay. So two questions so the there. Okay. <laughs> Great questions. So the first part is I am amazed at the number of people who've asked me this. Most of my husband's family can't wear watches. So I assumed that this was common knowledge. And it's only until after I published this book that there are people who can't, that people has never heard of someone who can't wear a watch. There's something in their body, something in their makeup that just renders watches useless. I know two members of my husband's family can't wear watches. And so I thought, wow. how cool. I thought that was the first time I had ever heard of it. Um, but that was 20 something years ago. So I thought, how cool is it just to have like this unique kind of character, you know, tweak that she just could not wear watches. And as far as her obsession with time, time is, so forgiveness is the theme, but there's an underscore kind of theme between, you know, grief and also time. And it's made reference many times about, you know, how long Sarah and Jacob were away. They know that time and how much time really just is that thing that we just cannot control and that it keeps moving us forward always. And so I wanted Sarah, not Sarah, Alana to have this obsession with time just so people can just realize that, you know, we are, we are slaves to time, that we have no control over it and it keeps moving forward always. And I wanted her LT notebook to kind of illustrate that, you know, we need to make the best of the time that we have. And so that was the purpose of the LT notebook. And then as far as what I would do, I'd probably hold time for 10 seconds, top time for 10 seconds. I really love that that scene in the book. And I think I would hold a moment in time. I think I, that's one of my favorite things. There's been, you know, these special moments in my life. And I thought, man, if I could just stay here and be here in it for a little extra time, that would be really special. I agree. There's, there is something about if I could just, like when yeah. you feel really good and you just like... Yeah this could last forever or for right. two more seconds if I knew I was going to get 10. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Uh, Ebony asks, I loved the interaction between Daniel and Jacob at the prison. We meet him as a character that uh, atoned for his actions and found God. But in the argument fight scene with Jacob, we see a glimpse of Daniel before Christ and the way he was before the assault happened. What made you add that argument scene? And Ooh. what mindset did you have to go into to be able to write that? That's a very good question, Ebony. Thank you. So um, there's a lot of me and my experiences in this book. So um, my older brother went to prison. Um, he is out and he has been living a great life the last 20 years and up, Mark, you know, perfect person today. But a lot of Jacob's frustrations of how he felt about his brother committing a crime, that was taken directly from my feelings of my brother. And so it was, I shouldn't say easy, but I was able to tap into my, that feeling. But the truth is about Daniel, about Birdie, about people in general, is that people don't change that quickly. You know, they may want to change, you know, and it's still down in them. They may, okay, Daniel found God and he was trying to be and trying to atone for the things that he did. But I wanted people to know and to understand that he, the, the, the original Daniel is still deep inside him. And it took one thing for him to bounce back. You know, people um, 
if they're drinkers or they they fall off the wagon all the time and they get back on the wagon, they, they go again. You know, if you have a temper, you may, you know, try to work on your temper, but then something may trigger you and, and you're angry for a second. And I really didn't want people to think that this book was about atoning um, Daniel and, and, and trying to appease him of everything that he's done. And that's why I wanted him to have that scene so people can say, oh, he's still there that he may have changed, but it's still within him. And so that's why that scene was so important for me to write because I did not want people to think that this was just a redemption story for Daniel. And the truth is people just don't change. And I wanted to, or completely change. You know, there's still, there's still something within their character that's within them. So that's why um, that scene was so important. Absolutely. And how did you get yourself into the mindset to write that? Um, just thinking about the fact that people don't change, it was more like, okay, what would he say to him in this moment? He was angry, you know, and this whole entire time, you know, the prison scenes were some of my favorite scenes to write about how they were rebuilding their relationship. And I wanted to kind of sucker punch the reader into thinking that everything was going to be okay and how he was going to handle it. And what does he do? He fall back, he falls back to the person that, you know, he was. And so that's what it, so it took that like, okay. What could, what would he say that would be a glimpse into who he really was or the person that he was before? And it was that, that line, which I won't, <laughs> won't repeat. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, but it was enough to show, wow, okay. Yeah. He still is this person. And even, you know, even with him finding God, I'm a Christian, even with him finding God, you still have those moments, you know, where you're not as Christian-like. <laughs> and so that was a perfect example of that. We definitely all have our moments. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one may be tough. Uh, who's your favorite character and why? Oh, man. <laughs> I know. I, I have to say Jacob. I have okay. to say Jacob. Jacob just, outside the fact that he bullied me into having his own POV in this book, but also just because I put him in such an impossible situation. I mean, here he is, you know, he's on the Parker Flats of Alaska. He sees his dead sister and she just tells him to go home. And he does that. And he goes home and he deals with Birdie, who was just this evil mother, you know, and mm -hmm. he's had that. And then, oh, he accidentally, and then he's found out his brother has cancer and then he needs to not only forgive him and talk to him for the first time in eight years, but, oh, he needs his bone marrow. And so he just got yanked into this situation. And then, oh, he wants to go to the science center because that's where him and his sister and his brother used to hang out. And he runs into this little girl who looks just like his sister. I mean, and then it's just, he was just put in such an impossible situation and he handled it with such grace. So I think he'd have to be my favorite character. And then his breakdown at the end of the, at the end of that chapter and that book was so therapeutic for me to write because it was so true like we had just been building all this stuff where Jacob had just been building and building and building and then finally he just snaps and it was great to show that even him as great as he was as good of a person he was even he had his moments to where he wasn't perfect as well absolutely and I think this kind of goes into that of the balance of perfect and imperfect uh, from Lucy, I was really moved by the acceptance that both Jacob and Sarah exhibited in the book. It made me reflect on my own practices and wonder about others. Do you have any personal recommendations or practices that you found helpful in cultivating a more forgiving and accepting attitude toward others? That's good. Um, so I wrote this book because my definition of forgiveness was challenged. You know, as I said, I'm a Christian. I was raised in a church and forgiveness was always something that we were taught that we needed to do. But I realized no one had ever defined forgiveness. No one ever told me that what forgiveness meant. It was always something I was supposed to do, but no one ever told me or challenged me to define it for myself. And after the South Carolina church shooting, which is one of the real life inspirations for this story, um, when the survivors walked into that courthouse and forgave the shooter, it was right then that I was like, oh goodness, I don't know anything about forgiveness. And so it, this book, writing this book and that incident allowed me to take a minute to define forgiveness for myself. And so that's the thing that, that advice that I would give you is what is, what does forgiveness mean for you? What does that entail? Because even to this day, I don't know if I, if someone hurt a family member of mine, if I could be as forgiving as the survivors of the South Carolina church shooting, or even as forgiving as my friend was. 
I don't know those things, but it's something that I at least allow myself to think about. And most people that I have encountered have talked to about this book had never considered what forgiveness means to them as well. It's just been something that we were told that we needed to do, but not what it means to forgive someone. Absolutely. Forgiveness takes so many forms and yeah. it's personal to all of us, but you, That's right. you, you really have to, you really have to grapple with it. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you um, do. How, oh, okay, here we go. Sorry. The, gotta love the live. <laughs> <laughs> From Delania, how did you get into writing and what resources and tools were helpful during your initial journey? Uh, I've been writing since the sixth grade, but probably before then, those my first memory of writing my first story was in the sixth grade. And I and I mentioned this in the acknowledgments in the back of my book. I had a wonderful sixth grade teacher named Julie Cook, and she encouraged me to write. And I remember just there was a program in school called Dear Drop Everything and Read. I don't know, I'm dating myself. Most most of you guys probably have never heard of that, but um she let me drop everything and write because she would see that I was writing. And so she asked me to share my story with the class and it was about them. The name of the book was called The Class Party. And she, I reluctantly read it to the class and they were laughing at the jokes and moved by the things that I wrote. And it was the first time that I could really see a, someone had a reaction to something that I wrote and I was hooked ever since then. I was hooked ever since then. And, and I, and I've done um, different forms of writing, uh, mostly freelance articles and things. And so um, the resources that I used is um, well, I have English degrees. So <laughs> going to college, of course, but that's not something that you necessarily have to do. The thing is about writing is if you're called to do it, to do it to sit down and to write. And even if that's only a sentence every day, if that's a hundred words every day, it's just to do it because writing I've learned is something that has to be cultivated and you have to water it over and over and over again. And you become a better writer by writing and reading. So that those are resources that I used. I love reading. As you can see, I have, these are just recent books that I have, but we're not going to talk about the other stack across the room <laughs> that, I, of <laughs> yeah. books that I have, but I read a lot of great books and I write. And so those are the best resources that I can tell you to do. I love that. Uh, going back to uh, something we had talked about earlier, your author's note, do you think, this is from Ebony Lee, uh, do you think there is a way that we can add trigger warnings to classics when the mm. authors are not here to express it? Oh, wow. That would be up to the publisher. Of but course. I know that'd be up to the publisher to include in any, you know, recent editions. But there are sites um, that's online now that you can go on to look for potential trigger warnings in all books. Um, I wish I knew some of them right off the top of my head, but there's been I've as, as a librarian, I've kind of directed people to some of these websites where they can go to read triggers because you know, um, like I said, I have several English degrees. And so, you know, reading stuff like Mark Twain and even, you know, some of my favorites, Faulkner, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Black people wasn't viewed in a in a nice way, you know. A lot of the N word, and um, as a woman, a lot of the women and the way women are treated in those books are sometimes in those classics are hard to read. And so, it would have been nice to have like a trigger to some of those. But um, the, the, there are websites that have um, kind of those triggers in there. But it, for the most part, it would be up to the publisher to to, to include. But, but good to know, of course, you can hop into different sites and kind of see what context recent readers and, and more updated mm -hmm. readers are giving to help us uh, to help us out. Right. Um, would you consider making a sequel? And that <laughs> blends very well into how <laughs> did writing your first book compare to writing your second book? We'll get two questions blended two together questions. there. <laughs> oh, a sequel. My goodness. I have been asked this, especially because the way the book ended, there have been mm -hmm. so many people that were like, how can you end a book that way? And I just thought it was bittersweet. I thought it was perfect. You know, I don't, you know, all my books are going to be that way. So that's a warning. Okay. That's a warning for anybody that's going to read long after and any other book I read, 
they're going to be these bittersweet endings just because I don't believe that life is, you know, summed up and wrapped up in this cute little bow and everybody just walks off into the sunset. I like to give people like a dose of reality when you when you pick up and read my books on how things could be. And so um, a sequel, I for a long time, I thought, no, like this story is told like there's nothing else left here. But I had a question from a reader and she says, you know, the, 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 the topic of conception um, after sexual assault, um, do you think that there's more left that you could say on that topic? That was an amazing question because it was a question I never considered not thought about. And I did so much research for this book. And the answer was yes, there's still so much more that I can write about. And so the idea of a sequel has just kind of been peaking in my mind. I'm writing another book that's not a sequel to uh, One Summer to Dinner right now. So maybe eventually, um, I don't know, but um, I used to say no, but so now I'm going to say I'm not going to close the door on it. Okay. And then okay. as far as, <laughs> and then as far as comparing the first book and the second book, my goodness, I thought the emotional heft of One Summer in Savannah was hard, but Long After is was so much harder for me to write because it features four POVs. And so, wow. and they all have their own individual stories, four siblings, and they each have their own individual struggles and stories. And you're talking about my unorganized, me being so unorganized, how I was able <laughs> to organize four POVs um, so yeah, writing One Summer in Savannah was a much easier book. And I say easier as in it wasn't really easy at all compared to <laughs> long after we're gone. Uh, to go for, you said I did two POVs. Here comes two more on top of it. <laughs> and I told my editor when I turned it in, I was like, I am never doing this again. Like I am not doing four POVs again. It was just... Oh, it was a lot, but, um, <laughs> but emotionally it wasn't based on, you know, someone that I knew. So for my, 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 the difference in one summer Savannah is a lot of the, the Sarah's feelings that she felt that was based on someone's real life, um, that I had to try to vocalize and try to put into words so the reader could understand and just a matter of trying to get it right. So I toyed over making sure that, I got it right. And so that makes that book so much harder compared to long after. Absolutely. Now I'm going to, again, blend a few different questions here into, <laughs> into one. We've yeah. got a lot of love for the audiobook, uh, especially the way that Zuzu did the narrations, like just so much beauty to it. What was your involvement like in the audiobook process? Did you have um, a voice in selecting the narrator? How did that go for you? Um, I did not get a chance to select the the narrator okay. for audiobook. Zuzu was a new audiobook um, narrator for me, but I love audiobooks. I this is how I listen or how I read a lot of my books now because I can listen in the car, I can listen while I'm at work, I can listen, you know, on planes. And so, um, no, I did not have a selection in, in it. But I thought she did a solid job. Um, in narration and maybe as you know I become a bigger name that I'll have an opportunity to have like a full cast like Daisy Jones and the Six had a full cast I mean and I'm like and um, Meryl Streep read um, Tom Lake you know by Ann no. Patchett and I was like my goodness so everyone that's watching you keep buying my books supporting me <laughs> Maybe we're going to get Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get Meryl Streep. And then Tom Hanks did The Dutch House by Ann Patch, the book before that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So fingers crossed, I'll get my Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks to read my audio book one day. <laughs> that, I, I imagine that's your full cast. It's Meryl Streep, Tom Hanks. You've got like... <laughs> my goodness. My goodness. You've got the, nice. the pantheon of, of Hollywood <laughs> into an audio book. My ugh. goodness. Yeah. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> I am a big audiobook reader as well like that is my yes. preferred format yeah I know you said you're you're kind of like really getting into it now would you say that's your preferred ebook physical audio how are you usually reading um I, I do both I do hardcover I'm still a hardcover person I love um hardcovers or any physical books but um, I've gotten to where now that I will only purchase like some of my my favorite books. Um, so I'll I'll listen for the audio and then I'll go buy it. 
And that's just another way of being able to support um, both the library, which is how I read and listen to a lot of my audiobooks, but then also support the author by going to actually buy the physical copy of the book. That is that is my big thing too, and why I have a huge collection of books. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what advice would you give authors who are trying to get their books published? That's from Kelsey. Ooh, Ooh Kelsey, it's not easy, but you have to you have to persevere. Writing, I mean, it's trying to get your book published. Just it has very little to actually to do with writing. The first thing I would tell you to do is to write a great book. You know, no matter how difficult it is to get it published, agents and publishers and editors, they are drawn to something that's going to knock their socks off. So the first step is to write an amazing book. And the next thing is to just develop this really hard shell about your writing and be open to edits and making changes and be open to anything, but also being open to the fact that publishing is going to knock you around. Man, it took I started pitching one summer in Savannah in January of 2021, and I did not get my book deal until December of 2021. I mean, it was a, it took a year and it was a process. And I'll be honest, one summer in Savannah could not, I mean, if it wasn't from my editor, you, I may not be sitting here to this day. Um, it took that long um, to be able to get it published and to get in, to get a book, a book deal for it. But, and it was a year of, you know, all these rejections, like, oh, we love the writing, but, oh, you know, it was, oh, this is great, but, you know, all those buts at the end of it. And I was starting to get worn down. Not only that, but One Summer Savannah is not the first book that I wrote. There's a, I have another book that I wrote that I tried years prior to get published and it just did not work out. And so you definitely have to understand this business and that how difficult it is, but also keep persevering forward, no matter how many rejections you get, no matter how many no's, how many doors is slammed in your face, is just to keep going. It, persistence, never, persistence. never giving up. Never give up. Uh, excuse the indulgent marketing question here, but this is, you know, coming from <laughs> me, it seems like, uh, from Imani. I actually love how I found the book on Libby as part of Together We Read. It's so hard to uncover new authors. How did you partner with them? Oh, well, I, <laughs> that's a very good question. It's actually a question that I don't know how to answer. It was, um, it was something that my publisher set up for me. Um, I believe that, um, the and I know that Together We Read, this digital book club only selects one title um, per year. And then there's another digital book club that Overdrive has called um, the Big Big Library Reads. And there's two of those per year. And so I can imagine that you have publishers that are pitching and begging Overdrive to please select my book, have my book chosen. And I, um, I got an email from... Um, this amazing library um, source books um, from Margaret, who works on the library side of source books, who is amazing and I love dearly, telling me that my book was selected for Together We Read, and I just could not believe it. And it's probably because of her, <laughs> probably because of Margaret. So we have to give Margaret at uh, source books a shout out for you know pitching this book. And the fact that I love hearing the fact that you have, that you discovered this book through this program, because I was telling Joe before we started that I feel as if this book has launched all over again, because the number of people that have reached out to me in emails and DMs telling me how much they enjoyed the book and these are readers who who might not have ever, otherwise ever picked it up. And so I love that you were able to discover um, this book that way. And I encourage you, whatever the next Together We Read book is, to, to select that one. You know, the next um, big read, big library read, select, pick those two, because that's the best way um, of being able to discover new authors. It is, uh, it's always a gift to be able to share. I mean, my job right. feels here like I'm just sharing books. So right. it's, <laughs> it's wonderful to do it. And yes, we were, we were so excited uh, that we could bring one summer in Savannah to, to Together We Read. Um, yeah. Alicia from Arizona wants to know what you are currently reading. I am currently reading Sex, Lies, and Sensibility by Nikki Payne. She is a writing friend of mine whose book just came out. And um, I'm going to dive into Kennedy Ryan's newest one as soon as I finish this one. But I also want to um, promote a book that just came out by one of my um, publishing siblings, um, 
the girls be sent away by Megan Church. Megan is a really close friend of mine. She hears all my whining about writing. <laughs> and so her book just came out on Tuesday. So I, I had the pleasure of being able to read that early and blurb that. So I just definitely want to give you guys, if you're looking for a new author, this is a very wonderful book. Um, and so her name is Megan Church and the girls be sent away. Oh, I, I love knowing that authors have book friends that they're like, these are my gripes of the day. <laughs> I'm yes. sending them to you. And yes. I'm also excited to start that one. I it's not right there, but it's it's on the it's on the stack upstairs. Yeah. It's amazing. It made book. it to the nightstand. It's, oh, it's it's on the nightstand. It's, it's coming next. up quick. <laughs> Uh, I swear this isn't a plant. Uh, Delana wants to know what's your favorite podcast, uh, aside from Emma and I, of course. <laughs> um, outside of the Professional Book Nerds podcast, uh, what do I like listening to? Man, do I have another podcast? My mind just went completely blank at I know, the moment. The hardest, the hardest questions are always like, what are you reading right now? And what but else I, do you I, like to listen to? <laughs> see, sorry. Um, but I will tell you, I listen to a lot of writing type of podcast. Um, the, if I can curse, um, I like mm -hmm. the shit, the shit that no one tells you about writing. I love that podcast. I listen to them and there's another, um, the writer's bone. I listen to the writer's bone podcast. They're starting to slowly come back to me, but most of the podcasts I listen to is, um, writing based. And that's, that definitely has to help in the process when you, maybe you're in a little bit of a slump or you're looking for, how do I take this to the next level? It's that's right. That's it's right. good to have either people you can bounce off of or people right. who are just feeding right. into you. Absolutely. In case we didn't hit all of them, everyone wants to know the three questions you're expecting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So the first one was, why did Hosea speak in poetry? The second one is what did the letter say that Jacob wrote that Hosea wanted um, Jacob to transcribe for him? And why was Jacob an identical twin? Because I know that part really just people are like, what in the world were you doing? And so I'll answer that question for anybody that's, that, that's, that's curious. So um, when I started writing this book, as I mentioned, Jacob didn't have a POV and he later got a POV. But the reason why that happened is because of something that was directly taken from, you know, my conversation and my interaction with my friend. She said, when I returned home, I had to face my past. And I just kept playing with me, like, how can I write that? How can I show that she had to face her past? And she said, I couldn't run from it anymore. It was always right in front of me. And I thought, okay, instead of making Jacob be a brother, because he was just going to be a brother. I thought, why not make him an identical twin and make her have to look at and face it and not only be able to look at it and see it, but be okay with it. And so I knew that I wanted Sarah to have to face her past. And so it's very symbolic. It's a very symbolic thing that some people have caught and the people that have caught that are just wonderful. And then some people are like, I don't know about that, Tara. And so when I first started writing, what I wanted for Sarah and Jacob was to just this bond that the two of them were going to have. And they were going to get really close because, you know, they were brought together by this tragic event. And I did not know that there were going to there was going to be this romantic, you know, aspect to the book. And I just wanted them to maybe just like share a kiss and something. And that was just going to be it. And my editor, Erin, just asked the best question ever. She says, because when I turned the book in, the scene on the stairs, which everybody knows about, did not, was not in the original when I turned the book in. It was not there. And Erin got it and she read it and she asked the best question. She said, do you think that we're cheating the reader? You know, you slow burn this between Sarah and Jacob the entire, you know, length of the book. You feel the reader be left out or cheated that if, you know, that you didn't include something with them. And I thought, no. I think I think that was that was enough. It was just that scene on the stairs was just going to be a nice embrace. And that was just pretty much going to be it. And I asked her, I said, well, why do you think, you know, the reader would feel left out? And she says, I think it would be healthy for the readers to see that Sarah could have a healthy sexual relationship after her assault. And I thought, my goodness, that is that's so perfect. And so before I wrote it, I went to my friend and said, hey, what do you think about this? Because 
again, I wanted to get this story right. Um, and so she, she said, oh my God, Tara, yes. That is one of the biggest issues that sexual assault survivors have is being able to feel comfortable and trust someone else, you know, after their assault. And so she was like, please write that. And once I had her endorsement on that, I thought, okay, this is, this is why I'm doing that. But for Jacob, for him, it was important for Sarah, for him to be able, for her to be able to see him and not Daniel throughout the entire book. He's saying mm -hmm. things like, I am not my brother. I am not my brother. And as an identical twin, you know, they tend to be this one person. And so that was a very pivotal moment for his story that Sarah could see him and not Daniel. And so it's very layered and it's not something that I feel like <laughs> that I, that people understood why I did it. I know a lot of people were like, no way, that's no way, you know, but yeah, it's possible. You know, it's very possible when you look at, you know, how it was just placed in the symbolism that was around it. And it speaks to both of their journeys of forgiveness. I mean, yes, yes, <laughs> without a doubt, without um, a doubt. On a completely different turn, how long did it take you to write One Summer in Savannah, and did you have to take breaks? Yes, I can start the last question. Yes, I take breaks because it's such an emotional, heavy book. You know, mm -hmm. writing the writing the the Jacob breakdown scene. You know, writing that last chapter. Um, just there's so many heavy kind of moments in the story and that I was like, okay, I need to take a break. I started writing this book in February of 2020 um, and I finished it in November of 2020. And I was able to write a lot of that because this was the COVID year. And so my library closed for three months. And so I, I really had time to just kind of lock into the story and be able to write a good good portion of it um, that way. And, but yes, I did take breaks. When my breaks that I took, I took from writing the heavy scenes and would write the lighter scenes, like the pizza Friday scene. You know, I felt like that was such a nice moment, light moment in the story. And I wanted to include some of those light moments in the story to kind of balance out the heavier ones. And so when I would, because I don't write in order, as you guys know, I don't write in order. So I'll write that scene and I'll go write this scene. And so I would take a break from that and kind of let that sit. And then I would go write Pizza Friday scene that would make me happy and smile and laugh and just kind of take away from that, the heaviness of that. So, um, yeah, so I wrote it in, you know, less than a year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, a very specific question or a specific detail in the story. Did Birdie have something to do with the breaking of the window? My assumption oh. is that she did, but I'd love to hear your perspective. That's from Lucy. <laughs> no, she did not. And I realized after the book came out, people read it. People were like, did Birdie break those windows? And I thought, oh my goodness, people are going to think this. No, she did not. It, it was just horrible timing that she was there that day. And then later on, the, the windows were broken out. But it was just a catalyst to get her and Jacob back together. Because right after that, right before that, Jacob had taken a break and he was gone from them for a while. He, he, his, his wall, his world was starting to crumble at that point. And so he just needed a break. And so that was my way of being able to get them and create this beautiful moment that came after, you know, the windows was broken. But no, Birdie did not have anything to do with the windows. <laughs> I mean, totally see why we want to know. <laughs> this is why I love readers so much because they pick up on things that you don't even think about. My goodness, mm -hmm. I was a, I love that. Brittany would like to know, would you like to see One Summer in Savannah made into a film or a TV series? And your thoughts on other books that have seen the like page to screen? I would love, I would love it. You know, the funny thing is, as I mentioned, I don't see scenes whenever I write. But there was one character who I did see, and it was Jacob character. And if anybody has watched Grey's Anatomy and they know who Jesse Williams is, Jesse Williams is Jacob in my head. I mean, and he's the only character that I saw and that that I was able to write and see. Um, so I would love to see One Summer in Savannah um, turned into, it's a movie. I don't feel like it's a series. I don't feel like there's enough there for a series, but I feel like it's a nice little cute two hour movie. I yeah. see... Um, Viola Davis or Angela Bassett being a birdie. Could y'all imagine? Goodness. Angela Bassett as birdie. Could you imagine that scene at the at the cemetery when she slaps Jacob? Can't you see Angela Bassett doing it? Does anybody know Angela Bassett that's on here? Can we get it to her people, please? Because <laughs> can, someone. I would just, can someone? But you know who I love for uh, for a Hosea? I love Sterling K. Brown from This Is Us. 
he could just deliver those. It has to be somebody that is trained to be able to deliver poetry. And I see Sterling K. Brown from This Is Us mm -hmm. delivering those lines. Man, my goodness. You need that, like, <laughs> has some classical, classical theater in them. Um... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's see. Well, we have time for, I think, just one more before we have to start to wind down a little bit. Um, okay. As a gifted and talented educator, uh, they really appreciated the way that you wrote gifted and talented individuals. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, it just jumped away from me. Let's see. As gifted and talented, um, how did you go about kind of really fleshing out these characters protecting them in a way but also delivering that authenticity well i, I did well i'm a librarian so i had to do research first and <laughs> <laughs> everything starts with the research and so i need to research genius you know what type of geniuses you know that there are different type of geniuses in this world and so i knew one of the things that i knew i wanted was for sarah to have a reason to come to savannah but a reason to stay as well and mm -hmm. so having Alana be this genius who's needed something more than the education that she was receiving in Maine was going to be that thing that was going to keep her in Georgia. And so I thought, why not make her really smart, you know, a, a genius? And so I was like, okay, what kind of type of genius could she be? And so once I landed on that, she was going to be a genius with, you know, with this ability to be able to do math and foreign languages, because that's a certain type of genius as well that has a math proficiency and foreign language proficiency that I knew then that I wanted the, the Weiler family to also be very smart. Now, a lot of people think it was a family of geniuses. They're, they, they weren't. They were just really smart because Jacob even says, I'm not smart enough, you know, to be able to do what Alana does. And so he wasn't a genius. Danny wasn't a genius. They were just really smart. You know, everybody's encountered that family, that the entire family is just, you know, these very smart people. And so that's when I realized that, okay, Alana's going to be a genius. And so it could be something that was from their line um, of family, from their, that's something that she inherited from the Wilders. It it goes back to the research. It goes back to the library to the every research. time. <laughs> every time well tara thank you so much for taking the time to join us all today and for writing this beautiful book i mean thank you thank and you and i also want to thank sourcebooks for providing the ebook and audiobook for together we read uh mm -hmm. before we go we've we've tossed it out here and there would you perhaps like to talk about long after we are gone yes thank you so um long after we're gone is tells a story of four siblings, each grappling with their own individual struggles, who return home after their father dies to save their ancestral land um, from being sold out from underneath them. And one of the things I discovered about myself in writing is I am drawn to these stories about these little known uh, unnerved circumstances that happen to people every day. You know, you have One Summer in Savannah that tells a story of a woman who conceived a child after a sexual assault. And that's not something that's covered often in fiction. And so I love the fact that we were able to kind of bring some awareness to these women, to the Sarahs of the world. And so Long After is also loosely based on these two brothers in North Carolina who went to jail for eight years after refusing to leave the land that their great grandfather had purchased a um, hundred years prior. And so I like taking these circumstances and these little unknown things and kind of fictionalizing them so as a way of being able to bring awareness to them. And this book really speaks to a term called heirs property. It's it's a it's a way that in, um, descendants inherit land very similar to holding stock in a company. And so with, but without a will, you know, they're not protected. And so that's what happens to the two brothers. That's what happens in this story with the four siblings. But it's a family. It's a messy, messy, messy family drama. And it's it's it has emotional parts to it. But you also have these four you know siblings that are not perfect people that are fighting to be, you know, good people and fighting for their family land at the same time. And so it's a story that really speaks to intergenerational trauma and the things that's passed down from generation to generation and, you know, what we hold on to and what we need to let go of. I can't wait to pick it up. <laughs> I I heard messy family drama and I was like, if I wasn't already set. <laughs> I love messy family dramas. Bring me all the mess. I, the more unlikable the character is, the better for me because- <laughs> If you don't like a character, that's one thing I've learned in my reading is if you find yourself frustrated and mad about a character, that means the writer did their job. 
to convince you that that person is not likable and to make you not likable. So the more messier the family dramas, the better for me. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I could <laughs> not in any way say it better myself. <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. thank you all so much for joining us. This has been our live Q&A with Tara Shelton Harris for Together We Read. Keep an eye on your emails. Five lucky winners will receive a signed copy of One Summer in Savannah and an advanced reader copy of Long After We're Gone. If you're not already a listener of the Professional Book Nerds podcast, I hope you'll give us a listen. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you else you get your podcasts. Thank you all so much for joining us, for reading thank this you. book, and for your amazing questions. Thank you so uh, much, everybody. Yes, thank you. And one final plug, if you're interested in more live content, Emma and I will be hosting the Libby Book Awards on Tuesday, March 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern via Zoom and YouTube. Okay. So happy reading, everyone. Okay. And you will be able to see a recording of this uh, at a later date. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, and happy reading.